When I was younger, I always wanted to be the best. Aim for the top, never miss an opportunity, and push to achieve success was the name of my game. I worked hard to achieve my goals, even if the highs were fleeting and my true calling may have laid elsewhere. I excelled in high school, top of my class, with thousands of hours of community service under my belt, I strove to be the best version of myself possible. Do the hobbies, volunteer, crush the SAT, grind, grind, grind. We've all been there, up late, working on something we care about, sacrificing time with family, friends, and loved ones, most often our diets, in the name of our pursuits. No time to sleep more than six hours a night for the high school version of me. Never mind the fact that if I had slept more, I may be six feet tall today, something I now direly wish for. No, for the younger version of me, hell-bent on achieving success at all costs, nothing would stand in my way of graduating high school as valedictorian and attending the best college possible, ultimately UC Berkeley. I was a star at my time at Berkeley. Hyper-focused on my GPA, I graduated one year early with an AA plus average. I had top internships at the White House and top law firms. The LSAT came and went. I scored in the 97th percentile. Before I knew it, I was accepted into the NYU School of Law, one of my dream schools at the time and one of the best law schools in the world. The onslaught of work continued at NYU, where I routinely pushed through 90-hour weeks to end the year in the top 3% of my class. I applied a transfer to both Harvard and Stanford Law Schools, and I'm accepted at both. I attend and eventually graduate from Harvard Law School, and I land my job at my dream law firm in Silicon Valley. I had done it, right? What every kid dreams of. Great high school career to a great college. Great college to a great law school. And great law school to a great job. I was 24 years old and a California licensed attorney making nearly $250,000 a year. I'm the king of the world, right? Well, what was the cost of all of the success? In high school, the rigor of SAT prep and AP courses sent me to the doctor's office. Stomach aches induced by gastritis, a stress-induced condition to blame. My college career may have been productive, but I was so deeply anxious at the time that I didn't make friends and I spent most of my time completely alone. The summer that I was studying for the LSAT and working full time, my grandmother passed away. The week after her funeral, panic attacks and hyperventilating began. And one week before my graduation at Berkeley, I curl over the bathroom sink overcome by a sensation of gagging as if I were going to throw up. Thankfully, nothing came out, but what began as a pesky problem soon became a crippling condition. The mystery gagging, as it were, took over my life. No more friends, no more eating, no more exercising. My life became centered around this mystery gagging sensation. I undergo a variety of tests, an ultrasound, and an endoscopy under anesthesia. Every single time the answer was the same, Julian, you look totally fine, save a small bit of excess stomach acid. I suffer through my 20s with this gagging sensation. Exercise, high stress events, and networking events were always the most difficult for me. In large crowds, you could find me in the corner, hiding away with my chewing gum at the ready. Handy in case my gagging would act up. One time during an interview, 
I succumbed to the sensation mid-sentence, and I spit up water at the interviewer's feet. It was as embarrassing as you can possibly imagine. Ultimately, five years of suffering through this would go by before I would explore mental health as a possible cause, in large part thanks to my mother who pushed me to explore it and take it more seriously. I learned the ways that stress could impact the body. I learned how to manage my stressors, and thankfully, I watched the issue disappear. Then the pandemic hit. I was a second year associate when the pandemic began. And though I was good at my role, I was never particularly energized by the work. It was, for lack of a better word, a job. Well, the pandemic had different plans for me. Isolated from the world with nothing to do but work, work, and work, my fulfillment in life went from neutral negative to destructive empty. The legal profession didn't care about COVID-19, isolation, or burnout. Attorneys at all levels began to become increasingly distraught, overworked, and isolated. I may have had my gagging under control, but my anxiety was far from being managed. Feeling totally powerless, I began to try to do anything that I could to feel in control. My job wouldn't bend to my will, so I explored entrepreneurialism on the side as a hobby. I moved things around my apartment incessantly. I tried, and I failed, to control the way that others around me communicated with me. Ultimately, left with no path or feeling of power, I began to try to control my thoughts themselves. This is when I became mildly depressed. Deep down, I knew there had to be another path. Nearly a year into the pandemic and feeling completely wiped out, isolated, and empty, I checked myself into mental health services committed to working on mental health. I sat down with a psychiatrist, I took various diagnostics, and I readied myself for whatever would come my way. I'm diagnosed with severe anxiety and mild depression. Well, this certainly isn't what I expected after working my whole life to get to the top. But it didn't end there. Two months into my mental health journey, I was met with fleeting suicidal ideation for the first time, where a quiet but clear voice whispered to me, life is just work now. What's the point of it all anyway? Wouldn't it be easier to just end it? I had never had this sort of ideation before, something for which I'm very grateful, but just like that, with enough stress, mismanagement, and despair, I found myself battling against the very real and very terrifying thoughts of self-harm. I kept my head down, and I worked hard on my mental health. I attended therapy religiously, I took mindfulness courses, and I practiced deep breathing like it was my middle name. Emotions from past years, ranging from anger to sadness, hit me like a train. For the first time, I began noticing and spotting the patterns of anxiety and managing them. My relationships began to improve, as did my outlook and my physical health. Eventually, the mild depression fell away. The deeper into the world of mental health education that I dove, the more in touch with myself I became. My wants, my needs, my preferences. I was on the road to recovery. Fast forward a few months, and I quit my job as a corporate attorney to focus on mental health. It was the last thing the young version of myself would have expected after giving everything my all to get the career. I was so focused on the moving goalposts, getting into the best college, getting into the best law school, getting into the best job, that I didn't pay as close attention to the big picture questions. Would I be fulfilled in the career that I set out for myself? What if times change and my strengths 
are no longer suited for this job. What would I do if I'm not happy? Such questions were secondary to the more urgent matters. When is my next exam? What interview questions am I going to be asked? And what is the median GPA of acceptance to the nation's top law schools? Growing up in a world focused on success, we hear about the riches from relentless hustling, the fame, the glory, the pedigree. But this part, the part that I was experiencing, the misery, the despair, the isolation, this part was conveniently left out of the narrative. And that's a big problem. My story, that of colloquial success, relentless self-judging, and mental health despair, is far from unique. We lose thousands every single year to mental health, and the collective suffering caused by mental health conditions is incalculable. What my story represents is a much deeper problem that we collectively must grapple with, a problem of misprioritization in what we define as success. A narrative forced on kids and parents that the only path forward is one of high stress and high achievement and the fear of what will happen without it. A deep-seated notion that reaching our goals rather than being fulfilled in the process of working towards them is all that matters and a system that provides only positive reinforcement for success, but pays no heed to the very real costs of reaching such heights. Since quitting my job, I've committed myself to fighting for the importance of mental health, to tell the world what happened to me so we can avoid stories like mine from arising in the future. It's long overdue that we revamp our social, political, and cultural realms to take mental health more seriously. I've heard from thousands of people who have had issues similar to my own, ranging from gagging to thoughts of self-harm to just plain misery. Folks who are teenagers, mid-career professionals, and retirees. Folks from law, medicine, academia, and finance. Folks from every part of the globe and from every income quartile. Hearing my story has sparked conversations at the dinner table, internal questioning, and courage from thousands to speak about their own experiences. I'm reminded of how pervasive this issue is every single time I hear from someone facing their own struggles. A gentle reminder that we're never alone despite how isolating our battles may feel to us. It's through these conversations that I've learned the most important lesson from my story. That there is power in speaking up about your struggles, no matter how big, small, significant, or consequential you believe them to be. There is power in admitting you don't have all the answers and looking to others with an open mind for support. There is power in transparency, especially when it feels uncomfortable. There is power in telling your story. Thank you.